Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sister Ruth Rosenbaum, and I'm the moderator today uh, for the roundtable Catholic Partnerships between the Global South and the Global North. We have three excellent speakers, and then there'll be some time for discussion and Q&A. Um, so I'm sure you won't be bored during the time we're, we're together. Um, I'd like to start, uh, Bruce, with asking you to unmute yourself and to begin your presentation. Bruce is the social justice and international outreach, is going to speak on social justice and international outreach dynamics of North-South uh, partnerships. And he has a very interesting perspective for us to begin our discussion. Bruce, you're on. Thank you and <clears throat> welcome everyone. I'm happy to be with you today to share um, a little bit about the work that I do for the Catholic Health Association and about social justice and international outreach dynamics of North-South partnerships. I'm the Senior Director of Global Health for the Catholic Health Association. The Catholic Health Association is a voluntary member association with approximately 600 hospital members across the United States 1,500 long-term care facilities. About 800,000 employees work for Catholic healthcare across the United States, and about one in seven patients are cared for by uh, one of our members. Uh, I work with our members on their global health initiatives. And I would just like to share a little bit about uh, that work and some of my previous experience uh, being part of North-South relationships. I really hope to engage you in some opportunity and discussion around the promise and pitfalls in North-South partnerships, how COVID-19, a little bit about how COVID-19 and challenges of new infectious disease might affect global health partnerships, and talk a little bit about some of the CHA tools, research, and related resources that are available to all of us for this journey. I'd like to start by having you type into the Q&A um, what you see in this picture. What does this picture, what do you see there? You could type into the Q&A. Young girl saving her brother, contaminated water. Um, oftentimes I'll hear people saying United in the background or the, the lady in the background who is trying to save them. And um, we sometimes hear two children playing. Uh, but I like to use this as an example of what happens when we walk into another country. We walk in without understanding often, without knowing their reality. And we make all kinds of assumptions. We think, oh my gosh, they're so poor. That means they don't have anything. They don't have any knowledge. Um, this particular photo is from a flood, but obviously they weren't in too much distress. There was someone there taking this photo and he felt he or she felt comfortable enough to take the photo instead of to help them. Uh, there is a person in the background. And so we make um, a lot of assumptions and we do the same when we work in global health partnerships far too often. So I, as I said, I work for CHA. I have four major areas that I, that I work on uh, with our members, really five, I'd say at this point. Um, we do research around uh, leading practices in um, global health initiatives. We've done that around short-term medical missions and uh, worked with both our members and people in the developing countries, those low and middle income countries to try and identify what were the strengths and weaknesses of short-term interactions? We've also done similar uh, research regarding donations of medical equipment and supplies. And in both cases, we've come up with best practices for hospitals and health systems and their employees in going on short-term medical missions, what kind of preparation and so forth you need to do. We've also talked to people about the kind of understanding you need to have around donations and created 
educational tools. So we take that research, turn it into education. We have also turned both of those into collaboratives where we are working with our members, with uh, not, other not-for-profits, with corporations, with governments, to really create collaboratives to assist in improving the donation of medical equipment and supplies to hospitals overseas. Uh, that one is called the Med Surplus Alliance, which now accredits um, donors of surplus equipment here in the United States uh, that are shipping overseas. Just a quick story. When I lived in Haiti, I unloaded seven containers of products that had been shipped by lovely people who thought they were doing wonderful things, but it took um, lots of money, lots of effort, and unbelievable amounts of time to sort through. And far too often, the things in those containers had nothing to do with the needs that we were trying to fill. And then we had to try and figure out what we were going to do with those things and not be more harmful to the environment. Um, Similarly, I led 13 mission trips from a diocese here in Springfield, Illinois, prior to going to Haiti and living there. And it was when I lived there that I realized how disruptive those short-term trips could be if they weren't done well. And so um, that really prompted me to come back to the United States and to help uh, people like those on this call and, and others to really try and ensure that when we do global health outreach, we really do it for the benefit of those people and with the humility, the cultural sensitivity, the true um, desire to impact the people that we're saying we help versus sometimes it feeling like I had people that were going on a vacation with me and they wanted to go back next year to the same site. Uh, um, so often it, it was, um, you know, the, the, the motivations did not match from one place to the, the other. At CHA, I work on a lot of collaboratives. I'm currently working on seven different collaboratives, one on water, sanitation, and hygiene in healthcare facilities. Uh, that is in collaboration with the Vatican and Caritas International, and Internationalis, uh, as well as Catholic Relief Services and uh, many, many others. Uh, we are working on a collaborative around um, short-term medical missions, as I already mentioned. Uh, additionally, we do a lot of consultation and we work uh, with our members as they are starting new programs or enhancing programs that they've been part of for a long time to try and ensure that they're doing uh, that work in the best, uh, best ways possible and that we bring uh, the new research and uh, lots of others into the conversations. And I do that by bringing those others in by doing a ton of networking on behalf of our members. Uh, working with the Vatican, as I already mentioned, the World Health Organization, USAID, um, and lots of NGOs and other partners around the world. And CHA works uh, very hard to create relationships so that our, as our members and their partners come to us, we're able to make the introductions and get them to the resources they are going to provide the best impact uh, to those they're, they're helping. I'd love to hear from those that are here again. Maybe you can type this uh, into the uh, Q&A. If you've had any experience yourselves in international missions, whether that was on a mission trip, through the collection of goods and sending overseas, through disaster response, or any other way, maybe funding, financial, and, and how you found that. Again, I'll just uh, let you type that in. If you, if you uh, see fit, just helps understand the kind of audience that we're talking to. Um, as we do this, you know, we, we need to remember that the loving our neighbor is a demand of the gospel, and it really does imply action for justice. And I really like to think that action for justice, action to uh, 
help someone, uh, to heal them, to lift them up is really compassionate action on behalf of justice. Um, so CHA has done a lot to uh, try and assist our members. And this is available to our members and everyone online. So I'd like to share um, some guiding principles that we have created. We really feel compelled to continue Jesus' mission of love and healing today as a US-based US Catholic healthcare association. And we brought together uh, CHA member leaders who were ethicists, formation leaders, mission leaders, people from advocacy that were working with the US government, sponsors of Catholic healthcare, uh, clinicians, and those that led short-term medical missions to come up with these guiding principles. There are six. Um, the first, as you see, is patience. Each of these has a sub category. Patience is build capacity, not dependency. And there um, are a lot of, uh, of stories about um, the work that we do and, and us as Americans, uh, Westerners, being impatient, wanting to see the impact right now. Uh, but too often, that means we go in and do it ourselves and we don't build the capacity that's necessary for the local organizations to be able to do it themselves. I know both of the presenters that are gonna follow me today are working in a patient manner. Uh, maybe not always, I, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to do, but to really, I know they're always working towards building capacity and not dependency. We have a lot of experience with that. CHA, um, after the earthquake in Haiti, worked with our members uh, to help rebuild St. Francis de Sales Hospital uh, in Port-au-Prince. St. Francis de Sales was killed in that uh, January 12th, 2000, or was, <laughs> was leveled in that January 12th, 2010 earthquake. About 70 people perished uh, in the hospital itself. Um, and on this picture here, you see Sister Carol Kean uh, standing in front, taking a moment of silence of what used in front of what used to be a five-story building that housed uh, several wards, including on the top two floors, uh, the maternal and newborn uh, ward. And when just three months prior to the earthquake, I was in that ward. I um, was working uh, as the co, the, as the founding president of Hospital Sisters Mission Outreach at the time, which was an organization that sent uh, um, appropriate, responsibly sent medical equipment and supplies to um, facilities overseas. And while we were visiting this facility, I saw two men carrying a uh, infant crib that had been donated by the organization that I had helped start with the hospital sisters. And I knew it was ours because the crib had been recovered. The reason we had received that donation was because the hospital had the, the, the bed, the mat was no longer useful and they would not allow an American baby to be on that, um, on that mattress without the appropriate covering. We had a gentleman who recovered every single one of those that had a nick um, so that it was just as safe and that the children were provided the same dignity as those that we have here. I saw that going up the stairs. I knew it was ours because he used a, a, a very unique fabric that we had ordered for him. And I, I felt compelled at that point to call him and say, you're making a difference. And so I stepped away from the group and I said, I called uh, the person and I said, dad, you and the work you're doing are making a difference in the lives of children here in Haiti. I just saw one of those beds that you take the time to recover for us for free uh, being carried. And I know there will be a baby in that bed tonight that will be able to rest comfortably and safely because it was fixed appropriately. 
Unfortunately, three months later, there was likely a baby in that bed when this five-story building became pancaked and basically uh, the, the height of a one-story building. Uh, however, with patience, um, three, four years after we started the, the, the fundraiser, we reopened Hospital St. Francis de Sales. I can promise you that it continues to take patience to work with them to try and ensure that this hospital is working well. Um, and we have tried very hard to stay out of the, way, of the way of the locals. It is owned by the Archdiocese of Port-au-Prince and has been for over a hundred years. And I will also tell you that by us staying out of the way uh, and letting the Archdiocese, this hospital is now struggling greatly. Um, but we really wanna respect our own principles and yet we're standing at the ready to try and assist them. The second is authenticity. Know yourself and know your partners. So patience isn't only needed, but it, it does play a good role in this authenticity itself. And there are so many motivations for us from the US and for our international partners to engage in these kind of global health activities. But we need to make sure that as we enter into uh, these kind of partnerships that we understand that from both perspectives and that we're in uh, really in a similar spot for where we want to head. Uh, so an invitation from a true partner who's part of the local community and its health system and has knowledge and understanding uh, of our perspective and also has um, you know, that same respect to, to provide full transparency to us. Uh, so CHA, again, um, uses these kind of um, our principles, and we have created some videos. This is a short video that talks about uh, maybe a partnership that wasn't quite done so authentically, and I'll let this play now. I'm so glad we could get out of the office for lunch today. Now I can show you some photos from my trip. I bet you didn't know I was an electrician and dietitian, did you? What? You got to build stuff and treat patients during your mission trip? I did. They need so much help that we really just did whatever we could. I got to be a nurse in the clinic and wire stuff up when we did construction nearby. OMG, that is so cool. Look how cute you look in your hard hat. I'm going to have to start calling you Construction Barbie. Oh, whatever. My hair was a mess over there. I went to the spa as soon as I got back. It was so worth it, though. I literally felt like we helped every single person there. They were so grateful and kind. We might not have been the best construction crew, and Lord knows I'm not a nurse. You know, I can barely work with band-aids. <laughs> but we figured something is always better than nothing, and those people made all the help they can get. Claro. Ese es mejor que nada. Claro, mi sería el show haber visto algunos de esos trabajos de enfermería y construcción en mi pueblo. Sí, estoy totalmente de acuerdo. Sabes que yo amo a los niños que veo aquí en los Estados Unidos. Pero cómo me gustaría regresar a mi casa con mi marido y familia. Él hace todo lo posible por encontrar trabajo, pero es un reto con todos estos grupos que van a trabajar gratis. Gracias a Dios les puedo mandar dinero. Yo también poder apoyar a mi familia, pero en mi casa y en mi pueblo sería un sueño. Mi hija trabaja para el Ministerio de Salud. Trabaja como día. Trabaja bien, pero tiene que viajar mucho. Me encantaría obtener el entrenamiento necesario para ser este, asistentes de enfermeras y después una enfermera certificada. Estoy ahorrando para pagar de los estudios. Sin tan solo estas personas que organizan estos viajes pudieran darle a nuestro personal de salud el entrenamiento que se necesita, eso sería una bendición. ¿No te parece? So once we wired this up, we turn on the electricity to see if it even worked. We held our breath, but then cheered when there was light, but it didn't catch on fire. All the local guys thought we were crazy. Claro, apuesto que se 
saber muchas cosas. Seguro que fue frustrante ver a otros hacer los trabajos que nuestros trabajadores locales podrían haber hecho. Desde la inundación ha habido tantos contratistas extranjeros que mi sobrino no ha podido encontrar su trabajo usual de mantenimiento y construcción. Como su esposo, ¿para qué pagarle a él cuando hay otros que lo hacen gratis? Incluso esos otros que no saben lo que nuestras viviendas tienen que soportar y cómo vivimos. Estoy completamente de acuerdo. ¿Sabes que Una parroquia local tuvieron que pintarla por dentro de varios colores simplemente para mantener ocupados a los voluntarios. Supongo que las intenciones son buenas y creo que eso es lo que importa. So I don't know if you saw that look at the end, um, but as Pope Francis says, it's not enough to give a sandwich if it isn't accompanied by the possibility of learning to stand on one's own feet. Charity that does not change the situation of the poor isn't enough. I'd love for you to take a few moments and just think about and write down what, surprise, what so far has surprised you what's disturbed you, and what is your key learning to date? And as we have a conversation later, maybe some of these will be uh, a key to be able to um, talk about what, what surprised you, what disturbed you, or what is your key learning. Uh, I'm going to wrap up uh, relatively quickly here. Uh, each of the um, principles, guiding principles, as I said, has the, the the title, Prudence, and this one, Don't Just Do It. They then have a little bit of a, a description underneath each one. And then in the Guiding Principles booklet, there are questions to consider for stakeholders and for others uh, to really think about what they're going to do. I have a couple of more videos. I'm going to skip the next one for in the, in the, in the, uh, for time purposes. Um, so I will stop this as soon as it starts, just to make sure we don't. Hi, can I sit here? Um, I would I would suggest that you all go and look at uh, the CHA video scenarios. There are several, and then behind each video, um, there are experts that talk about some of the things that you would have seen in the video. Some of the things to think about. Uh, I, I've talked, uh, as I wrap up, I'd really like to talk more about the guiding principles, but I think you get the, the sense there are six guiding principles. What I've been told by some of the sponsors in Catholic healthcare is that these are not guiding principles for global health activities. These are guiding principles that we should take into our everyday healthcare activities and maybe even further, just our everyday individual activities, uh, really uh, taking these to heart. Part of the guiding principles, however, is a modern day parable. And I think it's really important to leave you uh, with this video um, that was written by Father Michael Rozier, a Jesuit uh, now at St. Louis University. And Father Michael is the narrator of this um, video as this um, animated video as well. traveled halfway around the world to restore a failing orchard.
years, traveled. I traveled halfway around the world to restore a failing orchard. As they worked, they saw the trees grow in health and returned home with renewed spirit. They told many stories of their success and began gathering volunteers for the following year. But they did not see what became of the trees once they were gone. Some of the trees that were watered by hand during their time and looked so strong had no source of continued water after they left. So the fruit had to drink. Some of the trees had low branches trimmed. The higher branches could not be reached by the local workers who were given no ladders of their own. So the fruit grew, but withered and died on the tree. Some of the trees were uprooted and replanted in another part of the field that looked better, but that local workers knew often had terrible windstorms. So the fruit grew, but was blown off before it ripened. But some of the trees remained in the part of the field recommended by the local workers had an irrigation system built with local materials and were trimmed in a way that the workers could still access all the branches long after the volunteers returned home. These trees bore fruit a hundredfold, and the community had more to eat than ever before. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then those closest to him asked what this parable meant. He said, to you has been given the secret of curing the sick. The volunteers are well-intentioned medical professionals. The orchard is the community where they volunteer or send supplies. The trees that were watered for a while but were left to dry out are the patients who were given short-term fixes to long-term problems. It seems better to give them medication or donate whatever supplies are available, but sometimes something is not better than nothing. The trees that had fruit wither and die on the high branches because the local workers had no ladders. These are the patients who had complications arise after the volunteers left. The volunteers get the praise for the good, and the local health workers get blamed for what goes wrong after they leave. The trees that were replanted in a seemingly promising but ultimately devastating part of the field suffer because the volunteers failed to recognize the local workers no vital information about their own communities. Good intentions are not enough when people's lives are at stake. But as for the trees that remained in place, were irrigated properly and could be tended by local workers, these are the patients whose health improved and remained strong for years to come. The volunteers used their expertise to do great work, but they respected the unique knowledge of local workers. They donated supplies that were useful they provided care with the long term in mind, and they built capacity by ensuring local health workers were strengthened and not undermined by their work. A hundredfold bounty is just the beginning. There is good work to be done, and with God, all things are possible. So with God, all things are possible. I'd like for you to just take a moment to think about what did this parable bring to your mind? How did it make you think about some of the work you've done or been involved in, in your own community or internationally? We need to always consider the points being made in the guiding principles. While this is a formative experience, our formation, our reigniting of our call to service, the healing ministry, as we call it, simply cannot come at the cost of those who, we are, who are already burdened with exploitation and unjust policies and global markets. Ours must seek to bring about justice and be signs of compassion, humility, and respect. The work we do in Catholic healthcare and in Catholic education is on the shoulders of our founders and foundresses. They and our tradition and the social teachings call us forth to bring uh, glad tidings to all the poor, to help those who are vulnerable and to help bring about justice and equity. We only ask that as we work, as this work is conducted, that we consider that tradition 
apply the same standards of care and quality. And if we do, we are the hands of God and with God, all things are possible. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for that excellent uh, presentation and a lot to think about. Uh, a number of the things that you, you described there, I have seen in several countries. It's amazing how, uh, as I used to tell my students, it's okay to make mistakes, but please could we learn from them? Every mistake we make should be new and different. And invariably some student would say, well, why? This should it be different? I said, because boring. I said, and it's ignoring what we've learned to make the same kind of mistakes over and over again. There's so much to be learned. So thank you very, very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, our second uh, presenter this morning, excuse me, this afternoon is Sister Joan, all right, who has spent years in Sudan and has um, a very interesting and in-depth pers uh, perspective on how to create change on the ground and have the, that stay there within the community. So, Sister Joan, you're on. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the uh, DePaul University for inviting me to be part of this forum on global health. Uh, a picture uh, is worth a thousand words, so we're going to do some pictures. You can you see here that there are two logos. One is Friends in Solidarity, of which I am the president and uh, chief administrative officer, and then Solidarity with South Sudan. I will speak about Friends a little later, but for now I'd like to focus on Solidarity with South Sudan. This is a new model of ministry among the poor uh, built on a partnership between religious congregations primarily from the north and the Church of Sudan, South Sudan. It's all about building capacity, something that Bruce has spoken so eloquently about. But I do not believe that we can understand a country like South Sudan or this initiative without a bit of background. I always have to bring a map with me whenever I do uh, presentations because most people have never heard of South Sudan and certainly don't know where it's located. But it is in uh, Africa, Central Africa. It, at one point, Sudan itself was the largest country and it became independent from Great Britain and Egypt in 19, 1956. The colonial powers favored the Arab and Muslim North, and Khartoum was developed as a center of government. The South, primarily African, Christian, and traditionalist, was dominated by the military from the North and was a source of slaves and resources for the North. The Khartoum government imposed Sharia law and Arabic on the people of the South. The South fought against domination by the Khartoum government in which they had little representation. Three civil wars ensued. Millions of people died until there was a comprehensive peace agreement of 2005. This peace agreement guaranteed the right of the people of Southern Sudan to have a referendum to decide their future. July, in January of 2011, the people voted overwhelmingly for independence from Sudan. And on July 9th, 2011, celebrated joyfully their newfound freedom. While independence was something to be celebrated, in fact, this new country had no governmental infrastructure. All the structures of government and social services were in the North. There were also underlying ethnic tensions among the major tribes in the South that were never dealt with prior to independence. Tensions between the dominant tribe of the president, Salva Kiir, seen here on the left, and the vice president, Riek Machar, a new heir, erupted in Juba in late 2013, leading to the current civil war. 
During this conflict, approximately 400,000 people have died. Two million are internally displaced and another two million are refugees in surrounding countries. This is out of a population of about 12 million. Over 50% of the people are food insecure, some bordering on famine. The church has been actively involved in brokering peace in South Sudan. Pope Francis invited the leadership of South Sudan to come to the Vatican in 2019, where he personally met with them for several days, along with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the head of the Presbyterian Church, the three predominant um, religious groups in the South. During the concluding prayers, the Pope astounded everyone by kneeling and kissing the feet of the leaders in a plea for reconciliation and peace. The Pope intends to go to South Sudan in the near future when it's feasible. A ceasefire is in place since February 2020 and a transitional government of national unity was installed at that time. The implementation of the peace agreement is slow. There's continued fragmentation among the military and political parties. Local conflicts often flare up between herders and farmers over land. The country is awash with weapons and child soldiers learn early to carry guns. There is some attempt at trying to repatriate these child soldiers. Add to this secure flooding of the Nile and its tributaries, a plague of locusts threatening the South, and now we have COVID-19. Only 27% of the population is literate, 14% for women. 72% of children are not in school and there's a need for 26,000 teachers. South Sudan has the highest maternal mortality rate in the world and 10% of children die before the age of five. 80% of the people live below the poverty line. The economy, which showed such promise in 2011, has collapsed over the past 10 years. In 2013, when I first went to South Sudan, the value of the South Sudanese pound was 32 to the US dollar. It is now approximately 300 South Sudanese pounds to $1. Hunger is the greatest threat to what is left of any stability in the country. It was in, in this context that solidarity with South Sudan was born. The bishops of Sudan, knowing the lack of capacity in the country, reached out to the International Unions of Superiors General, the women and men religious, in Rome in late 2004, inviting them to come to Southern Sudan to assist with the building of the capacity of the people. This request came just after an International Congress on Consecrated Life, which had as its theme, passion for Christ, passion for humanity. The concluding document called on Catholic religious priests, brothers and sisters to search for a new paradigm of ministry, born of compassion for the scarred and downtrodden of the earth, around new priorities, new models of organization, and open and flexible collaboration between men and women of goodwill. Upon a formal request to this umbrella body called the International Union of Superiors General, in Rome to come and see a delegation visited the country in March 2006. They became aware that in the face of such enormous need, something new was needed. Uh, I will add here that the, that delegation in some cases had to stay in tents because most of the institutional church has been destroyed. The report of this first delegation was presented to both groups in May of 2006. Those who attended the meeting were asked, and I quote, to consider whether international religious congregations, that's Catholic priests, brothers and sisters, could respond to the needs of Southern Sudan in a way that would create a new paradigm by responding collaboratively and by living and working together. This new initiative would not belong to any one congregation. It would belong to us all 
it would be shaped together. The request was affirmed by those present at the meeting and initially 30 congregations responded with either personnel or funding. A second assessment took place in March of 2007, during which time it was decided in concert with the bishops to focus on teacher training, training of healthcare professionals and the formation of diocesan pastoral teams. An agricultural project in Remenze was later seen as a means to build the capacity of local farmers who were displaced by the conflict over many years and were without knowledge of appropriate and sustainable farming techniques. Here you see where the various projects are in the country. The first team of religious went to Southern Sudan, this is prior to independence, in 2008. Initially, two congregations assumed responsibility for coordinating the development of programs and facilities in education and healthcare. The De La Salle brothers coordinated teacher training and the Kamboni sisters healthcare training. Everything needed to be created from the ground up. The buildings and renovation of facilities was a costly and challenging venture given that all equipment and construction companies needed to be contracted from neighboring countries. Solar power was installed in all buildings for electricity, internet, and pumping of water. There are no connections. There's no electricity, no water, no post, no um, any kind of uh, services that you would need. There have been on average 25 to 32 men and women religious with a few laity coming from as many as 19 congregations and 20 countries working in South Sudan. This is the latest, one of the latest groups. More than 60 religious and several lay volunteers have been part of this initiative over the past 10 years. The Sudan Conference of Bishops is the Southern partner in this initiative. The church has suffered greatly during these civil wars at times, religious, many of whom were expatriates, were forced to flee. Dioceses are poorly resourced with little infrastructure and for many years without even appropriate and adequate leadership. Four new bishops have been appointed in the last couple of years. There is a strong ecumenical dimension to the church in South Sudan, with the South Sudan Council of Churches taking the lead on peacemaking in the country. So what's been accomplished over the past 10 to 12 years? Solidarity has built two teacher training colleges, which opened in early 2013. I was fortunate to be there for both of them, one in Yambio and one in Malaka, which is in the north. The latter, the one in Malaka, was taken over by the military in late 2013 at the beginning of the latest civil war. The C teacher training college at Yambio is, has become a national college, welcoming students from all over the country and from Nuba Mountains in the south, in the north, in Sudan. Over 500 primary school teachers have been trained and certified since 2013 through the college and also through distance learning programs, certifying teachers who are already employed by the government but not qualified. Some of those teachers have four years of education. Few have graduated from primary. Solidarity has also initiated a sustainable agricultural project in Remenze to train displaced people. Over 75 acres have been cleared by hand and over 40 tons of food are produced annually. Some of which is sold to the teacher training college and the rest in the local markets and for a local consumption. On the right hand side, you see Sister Rosa, a Vietnamese sister who is the, the brains and the motivation behind this project. Solidarity initiated pastoral programs in 2012. And now the team of four, there's only three shown here, but four is based at what's called the Good Shepherd Peace Center, which was built in 2016 and is owned by the Religious Superiors Association of South Sudan. 
As of May 2020, Solidarity is managing the facility and providing pastoral programs and trauma healing training programs. The center is the only facility of its kind in the country and is open to NGOs and faith-based groups. Solidarity rehabilitated the Catholic Health Training Institute, a two-story stone structure with staff bungalows built with funding from the German church in the late 1970s. It was virtually abandoned in 1983 when religious were driven out of the country due to civil war and a skeleton staff was left to guard the building. Following upon the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005, refugees began to return to the area. Many took up residence in the building with their animals in the Institute. Since the resettlement of the refugees and very extensive renovation in 2010, classrooms, dormitories, a small chapel and security wall have been built. A small agricultural project has also been developed. Initially, the Catholic Health Training Institute offered only a three-year registered nurses program, the first and only one in the country. The addition of registered midwifery program in 2012 came at the request of the Ministry of Health. Priority is given to recruiting young women. Since 2010, there has been an increase in the intake of women to train as healthcare professionals from 20% to nearly 50% in 2020. This is because most women in the country are not literate and don't finish high school. Many only don't even finish primary school before they're married off uh, by their families. And just imagine that the majority of midwives were men prior to our beginning to um, uh, train young women. Since the first graduation of registered nurses in 2013, 154 registered nurses and 71 registered midwives have graduated, most with distinction or high credit on the state exams. Here you see the different colors referring to the different um, uh, professions. They are sought off after for their clinical skills honed under the supervision of the staff at the Daniel Camponi Hospital in Wow. This hospital was reclaimed from the military and renovated by the sister, Camponi sisters to become a training hospital for students from the Catholic Health Training Institute. Annually, a couple of graduates are sent for advanced degrees with the hope of their returning as tutors. Graduates from the Catholic Health Training Institute can be found throughout the country and in Nuba Mountains. Uh, you can see 15 in 2018, this is a distribution map for 2018, 15 were sent back to Sudan to the Nuba Mountains to work with Dr. Tom Katenya in the uh, Mother of Mercy Hospital, the only one in the area. Nearly 90% of those who graduate are employed in the healthcare profession. So what about this North-South partnership? Let's do a little bit of work uh, looking at that. As you can see what, from what has already been said, the major commitment to capacity building has been made by religious congregation members of the International Unions of Superiors General based in Rome. Many of the congregations are missionary or international in nature with well-trained and experienced personnel to initiate the projects in the country. Friends in Solidarity, the organization which, uh, with which I, I work, is the US partner to Solidarity with South Sudan and was established as a not-for-profit organization at the end of 2015 at the request of the Board of Solidarity. The structure of Friends mirrors that of Solidarity. It was established by major superiors from several congregations in the US interested in the work of Solidarity. The board is composed of religious men and women from different congregations. Our purpose is to raise awareness of the work of Solidarity 
and seek funding to support the project in South Sudan. The commitment from the South is through a memorandum of understanding with the Catholic bishops of Sudan. The institutions built and managed by Solidarity are the property of the Catholic uh, Bishops Conference, the Sudan Catholic Bishops Conference. There's only one conference of bishops for Sudan and South Sudan. The costs of buildings and operations of these institutions currently are borne by Solidarity. Solidarity manages the finances and facilitates the fundraising to support these projects. Initially, the bishops offered land for building of the teacher training colleges and the development of the agricultural training project. They also paved the way with the government for the rehabilitation of the Catholic Health Training Institute. The St. Martin's Brothers, a local congregation, offered land for the building of the Good Shepherd Peace Center. One bishop is a member of the Board of Solidarity. The original 10-year timeline was unrealistic given the situation in the country. The Memorandum of Understanding has been extended to 2026 with an evaluation every three years. Most would agree that this will need to be extended. Solidarity is also aware that when the South Sudanese are able to manage the facilities, there will be a need for external support. With this in mind, a small endowment has been initiated. So what are some of the challenges and what have we learned? I've spoken much um, more extensively about this in the paper, but for um, this presentation, let me just share these. First of all, we could never have dreamed that the context of this work would change so dramatically in 10 years. The situation, while dire in 2005, held such promise. The country is rich in natural resources, oil, gold, minerals, and agricultural resources. We expected to have water and electricity from the towns and the roads would be improved. The economy has collapsed, corruption is rife. Regional banks and communication companies have closed. Roads are impassable and insecure. Recently, thanks be to God, the UN has been rehabilitating some of the major roads. The only paved roads or tarmac roads from Uganda to Juba and from the airport in Wau, airport of the governor to the airport. The development of structures for health and education are hindered by a lack of capacity, politics, and corruption. Were it not for the World Health Organization, there would be little or no ability to respond to the pandemic we are now in. Given the situation, solidarity has opted for national institutions rather than one in every diocese. This means they come from the 10 states of South Sudan, as well as Nuba Mountains. They're learning to live and work with people from different ethnic groups. And they will tell you that the most important thing that they have learned is to respect and appreciate their colleagues from different cultural groups. The future leaders of the country are being formed in solidarity institutions. Local resources have not developed as envisioned due to the ongoing conflict. This has necess necessitated full support with room and board for students attending the colleges. Initially, it was religious congregations supporting the projects. They were soon joined by Catholic agencies, primarily in Europe, with some help from US foundations. Solidarity is challenged to raise the funding needed to support this ministry. The bishops of, Su of Sudan, South Sudan, envisioned attracting religious congregations. They are concerned about capacity building to assume responsibility for the institutions. Issues of control of external funding and diocesan control of land and institutions have been raised by some bishops. The real question for solidarity and bishops is, do the bishops have the capacity to assume responsibility for the institutions created by solidarity. How long will it take? The answer is yet to be determined. With regard to long-term stability, those evaluating a project 
the project in 2018 stated, the uncertain political situation and uncertain future scenario in South Sudan makes it doubly difficult to prepare the next steps towards sustainability, let alone for the long-term future. The extended length of commitment to solidarity with South Sudan is also challenging for communities in the North. There are fewer experienced religious to send to South Sudan due to an aging population. International congregations with members in East Africa and Asia may be best placed to furnish personnel. The solidarity experience is also a good introduction to South Sudan. And in two cases, international congregations with members in solidarity are establishing intercultural communities in the country. A question, is solidarity a new paradigm for religious life or for ministry among the poor? The intercongregational model exclusive of priests, brothers and sisters is attractive to the North where religious are fewer in number. Some see it as a future of religious life. Here we have a North American contingent, so including a, Can a Canadian and also a layman. African congregations may be reluctant to send their members to join solidarity, preferring to live in their own communities. Cultural international community with men and women does take adjustment and need support. Few African congregations have the education and experience required to take on administration of institutions such as those developed by Solidarity. They often need educated personnel for their own congregational needs or depend on the salaries earned by such persons to support their congregation. Solidarity is committed to offering assistance to local congregations as they seek to build their capacity and encourages them to join the staff of the Teacher Training College and the Catholic Health Training Institute. Another question remains, does solidarity in the North-South partnerships with the South Sudan Church offer something important in the rebuilding of the capacity of the South Sudanese? The model of solidarity has the potential of being beneficial for religious both North and South. For those in the North, it's an opportunity to leave a legacy in the form of a transfer of skills from experienced religious in the North to religious and others in the South. A two to three year commitment by religious in the North brings new learning and skills to religious and laity in the South, a country desperate for the infusion of such skills and it reinvigorates a sense of mission for communities in the North. Religious in the South bring new energy for mission and a knowledge of effective interventions in their own country. Together, religious from the North and the South are committed to remaining with the people through thick and thin when others leave for the safety of their own countries. This gives them credibility with the people, the church and beyond. This is the Earth Day at the Catholic Health Training Institute. The solidarity model of intercultural living and working together is not lost on the students and local staff alike. It provides hope that South Sudanese from different cultures can learn to respect each other and live together in peace. Perhaps this is the greatest gift of solidarity to the church in South Sudan. Thank you for your attention and your interest in this North-South Partnership. Thank you very much, Sister John, for an excellent presentation. People also, if you would, those of you who have been listening, if you would just uh, keep track of what questions you have. After our third presentation, we'll have time to address questions to our, our speakers. Um, and I'll begin that Q&A thing with a couple of questions that I've come up myself, just so you understand that almost nothing is off limits. All right. Um, our third speaker today is Dr. David Gauss, all right, who founded the uh, Indian Health Development Center in South America. Um, one of the things in reading his biography, one of the things that struck me is how we think we begin our studies because we think we're going to be doing something. In this case, Dr. David began um, studying accounting. 
And then because he was inspired to do some mission work by uh, Father Hesburgh, who was then at Notre Dame, the president of Notre Dame, went back and then became a doctor. And that has then fed the work that he's been doing and so on. Um, one of the things, the other things that I've learned is that if you live long enough, you can do an awful lot of things. All right. So if you're listening to this and you're saying, well, I don't do that kind of thing, or I don't do this kind of kind of thing. You never know what's going to happen if we listen to the spirit. All right. So our third presenter is Dr. Gauss. All right. Uh, David, are you ready to uh, come on board? I am ready, sister. Thank you very much. Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the third speaker. I think I was supposed to be finished uh, at one o'clock. So I'm a little bit behind the eight ball here. I'm going to get through this as fast as I possibly can. As a uh, as was said, I've uh, been working in rural Ecuador for almost 25 years with a team of Ecuadorians to attempt an experiment of sorts. That experiment is to determine if high quality Western medicine can be introduced in a contextualized manner, appropriate for a community of poor rural Ecuadorians with a goal of providing care for anyone who desires it, but and equally as important and to accomplish this in a financially self-sustainable fashion. Of course, my personal learning curve along the way has been quite steep. Today, I'm here to share with you some personal reflections about that journey and on North-South partnerships within the circle of healthcare delivery. A few years into our health project, we had a problem with the local mayor and I told Diego, my right hand, my, 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 my right -hand man, whom I had, who I had hired about three months earlier, that I needed to go speak with the mayor. Diego said to me, <clears throat> excuse me, David, now is not the time. You'll send the wrong signal to him and he'll see it as a weakness. It's a bad decision, David. We argued fiercely about this for quite a while. And then Diego finally said to me, David, did you ever watch that television show when you were a kid called The Lone Ranger? Remember, remember his right-hand man, Tonto? Always humble and quiet, unassertive. I'm just gonna tell you right now, David, I'm never gonna be a Tonto with you. So just get used to that right now. I was angry initially, but from that moment, actually, we developed a fairly profound respect for each other. And that horizontal relationship has lasted for more than 20 years. In fact, there are times when Diego, as head of the operations, is actually my boss. During these past 20 years, I have also seen how difficult it can be for an Ecuadorian in a position of leadership to interact with other Ecuadorians when they see him or her as a yes man to the foreigner, or in this case, me. There are times when Diego has been disrespectful to me in front of the other Ecuadorians in the workplace. Yeah, I wanted to bite his head off, but I realized that he had to prop himself up to save face in front of other Ecuadorian professionals. Ecuador sees itself as a medical colony. Ecuador actually, we're talking here about uh, colonialism and Ecuador itself actually sees itself as a medical colony of industrialized countries. And I specifically say medical colony because my Ecuadorian colleagues have been saying it since I have known them. There's little scientific production coming out of Ecuador. So Ecuadorian health professionals look elsewhere for ongoing knowledge and medical developments. Many of Ecuador's top physicians leave Ecuador for training, for residency training and uh, returning with a desire to employ what they've learned outside of the country. Many Ecuadorian physicians read websites such as Up to Date for their continuing medical education. However, Up to Date is certainly not contextualized nor was it ever intended to be for countries such as Ecuador. Now, poverty is a highly complex situation with endless layers to it. We could talk about that for hours. The fact of the matter is I have never been poor and I have never lived in rural Ecuador. From my perspective, it's arrogant and assuming to think that I can understand the life of a poor person working the land in rural Ecuador. I have never walked in the steps of this anthropological other, and I never will. 
I misunderstand less about poverty than I did 25 years ago. And that's about all I can say. I could read all the medical anthropology books and articles and still not get any closer. So it is the willingness to humbly acknowledge this lack of understanding of poverty, which I believe is a first and critical step in North-South global relations. There are many decisions Diego and our Ecuadorian team make that I simply don't understand, but they end up working. Well, most of them anyway, but I do not and should not feel the need to control those decisions. So for example, we received a grant from the Ronald McDonald House Charities to provide subsidized prenatal care and to deliver babies. The grand assumption of development agencies is that poor women in rural areas die from obstetrics complications because they are unaware of the risks of, de of delivering babies at home. We conducted focus group research and we discovered that the reason women delivered at home is because they either didn't trust the public health services or because they couldn't afford childbirth at a private clinic. In fact, they were largely very well aware of the risks of home delivery. So it was not an educational barrier at all. It was an economic barrier. When they heard of the low cost of childbirths that were subsidized at our facility, many women signed up to, to, to deliver at our place. Our Ecuadorian team decided not to include an educational component to the program based on the focus groups. I couldn't believe it initially, but they were right. Now, a few words about community power dynamics. We could go back to that one. So I'll tell you right now that not in undergraduate education, not in graduate education, I don't care what discipline you're in, if it's the social sciences or medicine or anything, any of the, dis any of the academic disciplines, we are not taught about power in school at any level. Sadly, we have to live life to learn this. Now, understanding power dynamics is critical in any workplace, in any country, in Chicago. And I would bet even at a place like DePaul University. I have listed here where power dynamics require understanding for community development projects to succeed, or at least to minimize their, their failure. So the relationships between formal and informal leaders in the community, the relationships between NGO and the community, an NGO and other institutional relationships, interinstitutional relationships um, between public sector and then the community. So all of these things are critical. And to give you an example of that, I'd like to tell you this story. Carlos was uh, another gentleman that worked in our organization. He was the first Ecuadorian community leader we worked with in our first community. What we didn't know about Carlos is that he did not have a good relationship with the local Spanish priest. And I say Spanish, but I don't mean Ecuadorian, I mean literally from Spain. And furthermore, the mayor of the town was an altar boy to the priest at an earlier age. And therefore by choosing Carlos as our community partner and our community intermediary and representative, we immediately inherited the ire of the priest and the mayor who were arguably the most powerful formal leaders in the community. And to finish this story, the provincial governor, a very good friend of Carlos's and actually a very good friend of mine was learning of the improprieties between the mayor's office and the church in the neighborhood. And this provincial governor was assassinated in his weekend home in our community. Carlos tragically came into work the next day armed with a pistol saying he was going hunting for a mayor. Ultimately, the mayor went to jail, but we had to fire Carlos. I obviously did not have a good understanding at the time of the power dynamics between Carlos, the mayor, and the Spanish priest. And, and I should have, but you all tell me, how do you teach that in school? Let's say a few things about the hegemony of the biomedical model. So most of us working in healthcare do not understand how strong the biomedical model is ingrained 
in the epistemology of medicine. The biomedical model is the exclusive focus on the biological factors of health and on reductionism. It excludes psychological, environmental, and social factors. Now, hegemony is usually reserved for geopolitical conversations, but it applies to medicine as well. And the hegemony of the biomedical model refers to the power this model possesses to suppress the models that provide alternatives to the biomedical model that could address the state of health of a person or a community. Now, to be fair, incredible advances in health have been achieved through the biomedical model, but the complexity of health and wellness certainly requires more than the biomedical model. The global north depends greatly on the biomedical model, yet the global south, while acknowledging its utility, have large expanses of populations whose worldviews are distinct and not necessarily accepting of the biomedical model. To give you an example of this, in our community in, in Pedro Vicente Malinaldo in rural Ecuador, about five years into the project, an elderly gentleman bumped into me on, the, on Main Street one day. And he said, you know, Doc, you know, when this project first, before this project came to town, people in Pedro Vicente Malinado, they were born, they lived, and they died. And now you guys are here, and I, you know, I guess you're doing good work, but now everyone's got diseases, and everyone's taking medications. So I don't know. I don't know what to make out of it. I, you know, I guess it's a good thing you're here, but I'm just a little bit confused by this. The man actually just did a complete attack on the biomedical model without even understanding what the biomedical model was. With the arrival of our hospital and clinic into the community, we mistakenly thought that we would move the community via the biomedical model up to the 21st century. In fact, the community has forced us to acknowledge that their worldview with respect to health. And we now have a hybridized approach that, well, I don't know what time we are on, frankly. The Global South teaches us to recognize the limitations of hegemony or unquestioned power of the biomedical model. Without that recognition, South-North relations in health development are likely to be severely limited. I'd like to say a few words about someone named Ferguson. If you could have the next slide. So uh, Ferguson wrote a book called The Anti-Politics Machine. And what I see as sort of an extension of the hegemony of the biomedical model into the international development community, Ferguson in his book, The Anti-Politics Machine, describes the international aid community's ability to depoliticize and technicalize local social realities with generally accepted development strategies from the North. In doing so, in doing so, they remove local context and assert control over these communities. He suggests that this strategy of technical solutions without local context actually perpetuates structural inequalities. He calls it the anti-politics machine because he claims that development organizations making blatantly political decisions about resource allocation appears technical solutions to technical problems. His book focuses on how development agencies choose to ignore how the country of Lesotho's economy revolved around its role as a labor reserve for South African mines, avoiding the very uncomfortable politics of apartheid. One example of this that we lived in our communities was that of the discovery we made about that maternal mortality seemed to be more of an economic issue than an educational issue. How many development programs around the world continue to insist that maternal mortality requires primarily an educational strategy, effectively ignoring the uncomfortable discussion of the politics of poverty and maternal mortality? Another example, is the H1N1 threat several years ago. The Global North strongly suggested that the Global South ramp up strategies of prevention, diagnosis, isolation, and treatment. Ecuador spent countless millions on this threat that actually never materialized. Meanwhile, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis wreaked havoc in Ecuador 
and had been up at least to, uh, at least up until that point anyway largely ignored. Next slide. Now, since Ferguson, uh, and we don't have a lot of time to get into this deeply, but I just would like to mention that investigators since Ferguson have found that formal project development reports written jointly by international agencies and host country development professionals continue to espouse classic dated technical solutions that everyone at the table knows will not work. But the power of the universal codes and the power of hegemony of the fundamental ideas about poverty and economics and biomedicine insulates the development of programs from critical scrutiny and the continued failures of programs get buried. The fact of the matter is the question of what is to be done in the arena of global health development cloaks internet interventions of special interest groups like governments, aid agencies and other powerful sectors. It cloaks them as universal, disinterested and benevolent. Asking powerful actors how to empower the poor has obviously inherent contradictions, but question that, questioning that machinery is intimidating and uncomfortable. I'd like to say a few words about qualitative versus quantitative research. A fundamental component of the biomedical model is numerical or quantitative. Quantitative research is where most of the international health funding is channeled. Qualitative research in health, and by qualitative, I'm not talking about quality of care research. I'm talking about the opposite of quantitative. Qualitative has been relegated to a lower level of importance. But the qualitative research reveals many aspects that explain much of the culture and health system that is actually not specifically captured in quantitative research. But this qualitative research does not find its way into highly visible international journals. So a quantitative study discusses alarming statistics on say, for example, domestic violence, but a qualitative study that shares testimonies from victims with specific details of physical violence gives a clear picture of the horrors that happen to women in poor, in poor rural settings. Or a quantitative study in The Lancet reports on healthcare quality disparities by comparing mortality rates of such things like acute appendicitis in Sub-Saharan Africa versus acute appendicitis in the United States, demonstrating the great disparity. But a qualitative study with testimonies from patients and families experiences illustrating the devastations and very real challenges faced by a, a healthcare system would potentially be much more impactful. So in summary, I believe that no South North partnerships must be based on mutual respect. I know that sounds cliche, but remember the Tonto and the Lone Ranger story. Boots on the ground NGOs require leadership that understands the complexity of power dynamics in the community. And that includes public institutions, the NGOs themselves, and the community. Most of medicine is based on the biomedical model. Do not underestimate how deeply that model is embedded in you if you are trained in the, in the healthcare or allied healthcare services, yet how little it might matter to communities in the global south. So contextualization is of prime importance. So what have we accomplished as an organization in the last 25 years? I would humbly submit that we've demonstrated that financial self-sustainability for medical operations is an attainable goal, at least in the Andean region. That an arguably pre-modern community will use Western medicine when they deem it appropriate that training Ecuadorian physicians who remain in the countryside can be impactful, and that people from places like the United States that go to low-income countries to establish healthcare projects should see themselves more as bridges that connect resources to bright, resourceful Ecuadorians rather than see themselves as the ones who might necessarily execute operations. Leave that to your in-country team. I was asked to say a few words about uh, 
potentially equitable equitable ways for the COVID vaccine to be distributed uh, at, at the global level. And I do have a couple reflections of those, but I will, uh, reflections about that, but I will tell you, I don't have an answer for you. One of the major limitations of global health is the lack of governability. Global health continues to be subjected to the will of individual nations and nations do what is in their best interest. Now the pandemic forces nations to think beyond their own interests. If the global South remains essentially unvaccinated, ongoing community transmission results in more mutations of the virus, which could render the already vaccinated countries of the world at risk once again. But as a planet, how, how do we govern that? I believe the World Health Organization needs greater teeth in policy decisions and in enforcement. I feel like they've lost much of that in the past two decades. Upwards of 10 billion doses of vaccine are required for the global South. I don't see a way forward without a stronger global health government. And that means rethinking the power of the already weakened WHO. WHO has established something called COVAX, which is the COVID-19 vaccine global access facility that attempts to improve equitable allocations of vaccine. And for example, phase one would include the highest priority groups, healthcare workers, older adults, which could be up to 20% of the population. Phase two includes other vulnerable populations. Then there are humanitarian buffer strategies for refugees and asylum seekers. But once again, we are left wondering how to execute these, these policies in countries that do not see the WHO as the government of global health. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You certainly have given us an awful lot of things to think about, all right? Um, if everybody would take a moment uh, to put questions that you have, uh, so to format the questions that you have, and then we'll be able to, um, then we'll see what we can do about getting them, uh, getting them answered and so on. First, let's start. Do any of our presenters have any questions for other presenters? I, I had a uh, question for Bruce, if I could. Go ahead. Bruce, you had talked about um, the establishment of uh, best practices. I was just curious, who was, who was at the table to decide who those best practices are? How did, how did that process uh, occur? So we have done, um, we, we had engaged researchers um, from some consulting firms as well as universities in the United States. Uh, and then we engaged people both in the United States uh, about what the practices were and how they felt about them. And then we followed that up with in-country um, conversations with people about their feelings about how this came across in short-term medical missions as well as medical donations, and then took all of that and turned those into the recommendation. So um, at the table were uh, providing answers were all of the people. And then we sent those back to um, a good number of the people who had responded to surveys to actually look at the recommendations themselves. Thank you. I actually had a question for you as well, David. Um, you talked about uh, that the the culture and the and the dimensions of culture and how it's so different. And I wondered if you were familiar with um, Gert Hofstede and the the country comparison tool that you can use to highlight. Um, different countries and the six different power dynamics of national culture. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know that actually. I don't know that piece. It's a it's a wonderful tool for anybody that's thinking about starting this. I'm going to put it in the chat for everyone. Uh, a wonderful tool for um, for looking at it. I I've actually taken some of the certification courses for the Hofstede. Uh, cultural insights and quite amazing and really does talk about that power distance and how it's different from one culture to another. Um, there's six different dimensions of, of cultural competence that are in there. 
So thank you. It's a question for everybody. It's come from people in a variety of ways. How do you stay out of politics within the country or how do you uh, keep what you're doing from being attached to politics? We could ask that question here in the US also, but we won't for today. I'll be glad to start the discussion. Uh, we work very closely in South Sudan with the ministries, whether it's the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of South, South Sudan or the uh, Catholic Health Training or Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, we do not get involved with the politics because in South Sudan, the politics is very uh, divisive. It's tribal, there are 60 different tribes and uh, the current government tends to be um, headed by the dominant tribe uh, who uh, are in conflict with the second largest tribe. And that there's all kinds of splits. So um, we try not to get involved with the, the politics, uh, uh, the national politics, but we're more closely through the states uh, to get certification, to help develop curriculum, whatever. Sister Anybody Ruth, else? David? I was just gonna say, I think that's uh, an important question. And I've, I've got kind of strong feelings about that. I would tell you that I, health is so intertwined with politics. And, I, when, I, and when I say politics, I'd like to distinguish political parties from politics in general. But I, it's, I think it's impossible to talk about health, the health sector without talking about, and I don't mean party politics, but politics in general. And I think oftentimes the global north uh, likes to think that most of the decisions and most, most of the solutions to problems are technical solutions. When the fact of the matter is the technical piece is a very small part of it. That has to be there, of course. But if there isn't political will behind it, and then if there isn't financial will behind it, and if there isn't legal, uh, a legal framework for it, you're never going to get off the ground. And so it's impossible to live exclusively in a technical world in this kind of work. I think it's a recipe for failure. I feel like it's been, for me, that's been a personal experience I've had here. I think your comments yeah. around power dynamics are so important because oh, yeah. um, uh, certainly when we started, the first thing we did was to engage the local uh, authorities around, uh, for instance, with the Catholic Health Training Institute, even reestablishing it as a health training institute, and then working with them on development of curriculum and making sure it was uh, uh, compliant, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, and I, I think that, that that's a really important piece. I'm almost thinking that anybody who goes overseas ought to take a course in cultural anthropology. Mm -hmm. Bruce, do you want to add anything? I would, just, I would say that CHA really tries to work on policy at the WHO, PAHO, USAID, and other levels, even within the church. Um, but we, for the most part, it, we, we stay out of Politi the politics. Uh, however, um, you know, we are really encouraging our, our members and others to work with the Ministry of Health to un understand their priorities and to know how they're helping to meet those priorities. Uh, far too often there's been skepticism of the local authorities and far too often for good reason, but we've got to continue to build those bridges, I believe, and, and understanding their priorities um, is such an important piece of that, those local political or local health uh, priorities as well. I, I have a question, okay. I have a question here that, that's, that was asked about um, communities' um, ability to, if, if they've lost their ability to suffer, and a, and a discussion a little bit about Ivan Illich's uh, explanations for this uh, that he gave in a, in a piece a long time ago that he wrote. I, I think that there is, or whether or not the um, people have lost their agency in the process. 
um, I think it's a really valid, valid question. I, I think that as, uh, as healthcare systems move into communities that had alternative ways of managing their, their own perceived health problems, there is a tendency to lose agency. Um, and there's, a, there's also a tendency on the part of the healthcare, the formal healthcare system to not necessarily acknowledge uh, the certain kinds of suffering that people experience because it doesn't necessarily fit within the biomedical model. And so that's where we see things manifest themselves such as somatization disorders and, and people somaticize problems that are not acknowledged by the West. They, they have a problem that's not acknowledged by Western medicine. And so they somaticize it in the forms of headache or belly pain or pelvic pain or things like that just to be able to gain access and to be validated by the healthcare system. So I think it is a very valid question and I think it is an issue that needs to be addressed and it's a great question. I could add another dimension to this with the question. Um, how do you avoid gender politics in different countries? All right, and just to give you a very simple uh, Example, all right. I was up in the mountains in Guatemala with my colleague Aida, and um, we were spending the night at the home of the leader of the cooperative. It was a coffee cooperative. All right, very, very simple, simple place. All right, and it came time to eat, and he for dinner he called us or for the evening meal. Call it dinner is kind of an exaggeration. Anyway. And Aida and I sat down and he sat down next to me and his wife came and brought the food. And then she went back into the cooking area and he started eating. And he said to the two of us, you know, eat, eat, you know. And Aida said to him in Spanish, no, we're gonna wait until your wife comes. She's cooked, she's our hostess, all right. And he said to us in our culture, this is Mayan culture, not Guatemalan culture, in my in our culture, women and men don't eat together. Aida looked at me, I looked at Aida, we took our plates and we went to eat with the women. And he asked us where we're going and we said, we didn't want to violate their culture, <laughs> we were gonna go eat with the women. He wanted to eat with us and talk with us so badly that for the first time since they were married and they had a son who was in his twenties, for the first time since they were married, this husband and wife ate together. And then they did for the rest of the time that we stayed there. It was for us a, a it, it's a great example. I mean, it happens in a lot of places and so on, but it was a great example of what happens when you bump up, you're not trying to violate anything, but you're bumping up against us. How do you handle things like that? To be able to move forward the work that you're doing. Like Sister Joan, you know, you had so many women that were in the training programs and so yeah. on. Um, I think uh, that's been a real challenge for us because in a place like South Sudan, women have no status. In fact, your status is equated with uh, the color of the cows and the cows have a greater um, right. status than the women. And so what happens is that by, very, by the very fact of keeping them in school, whether mm -hmm. it's at primary school, secondary school, level, there are only two secondary schools for girls in the country, both mm -hmm. one run by uh, um, the Loretto sisters in the north. Anyway, um, what happens is that the very fact that we're trying to have an equal number of women and men in teacher training, or in both teacher training and the Catholic Health Training Institute, uh, the men have to work with the women. They also have to work across tribes. And if they're there during the holidays, they have to cook together. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are learning how to work with women mm -hmm. as co-equal partners. Yeah. And uh, they're having that experience and it's a three-year experience. So at the end of that time, uh, they are changed yeah. for the most part. This is so, an enormous um, problem. I think that's... Uh, one of the ways, and also in the country now, it's there must be 50% women on the local legislatures. Wow. It isn't always working, but that's part of the new 
agreement. Thank you. David or Bruce, do you want to add anything? Bruce, the look on your face is... There's so much I want to say and so much I don't know if I should say, uh, because I think one of the problems is also at the root of our church and some of our issues have been with the, the people running hospitals that are uh, from the diocese in the church. And if, yeah. they're not a, if they're not a priest, they may not get the same reaction or uh, benefit. So there's, there's a lot, there's still a lot to accomplish um, in our own church and uh, in other cultures. Oh, that's the understatement of the year. All right, thank you. David? Um, I, we, we have one of the ways that we try and address it is that we try to make most of our employees women. About 80% of our employees are women in our, in our hospitals and clinics. So I'm, I'm very proud to be able to say that. And I think that neutralizes a lot of the, the machismo culture, not a lot, not all of it by a long shot, but a, a lot of it. Some, someone had asked the question also, I'm looking at this about uh, how do you avoid the critique of the white savior complex? And yeah. no matter what is done, whites are accused of this. I, I'd like to just make a quick comment on that and just say that uh, it's, it's something that evolves with time, but I will tell you that I personally have been very conscientious about this. And I, the, the, the two communities that we uh, have, our hospitals and clinics, I do not live in either one of those. Um, I made a conscious decision to live outside of the community. Now, some people would argue, how can you uh, administer to that community and not live in that community? But I'll, someday someone will judge me on that down the road. I'm not sure if it was the right decision, but not living in the community and anytime something had to be, any interface there was between our healthcare services, the mayor's office or other, other public institutions or the community, I wasn't at those meetings. I let our Ecuadorian colleagues uh, be the face of the organization. So it's been, uh, but the flip side of that is in-house, my Ecuadorian colleagues always tell me that I should be as strict with our learners as they've seen me be strict with learners that come from the United States. And so uh, there's no advantage to being softer on people uh, just because they're from another culture in terms of the technical skills they need to acquire as being physicians or nurses. But in the other piece, it's more of a, uh, it's definitely put the Ecuadorian face out there because they're the ones that are really making these decisions. Um, we have a question from one of the participants. How do you evaluate things that haven't worked and how do you take the learnings from them in the way you move forward? Not calling them mistakes, but just things that didn't work. That's a hard one. Actually, that's not, that's not, go ahead, Joan. No, go ahead, David. Now I was gonna say, I could, we could probably, our organization could probably write a book with a number of volumes on how not to do the work that we, we do in Ecuador. Uh, we made endless numbers of mistakes and, but that's all part of the process. And as I think Sister Joan mentioned before, maybe it was you, Sister Ruth, the trick is to not make the same mistakes over and over again but to learn from them and learn from other people. Uh, uh, Bill Faggy once said that it's not just about doing something, it's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been enough foolish things that have been done in the name of global health yes. over the last 50 years that I think we can learn from those things and not make those same mistakes. Um, but we spent a lot of time going over our mistakes. And we said, just to give a small example, we started selling small little prepaid healthcare insurance policies uh, that just did not catch on. And you could talk a little bit about, and I'm not gonna do this now, but about how, what, what, a, what a flop that was and how challenging it was in the community. And we, we dumped the idea after about six months. But you, know, you have to go through the uh-uhs to get to an uh-huh, right? Yeah, I think you need a, an ongoing evaluation uh, recently. I'll just give one example. Uh, during the COVID, um, the governments shut down all of the institutions from March to October in 2020, and again, February to April. Okay, so it's been a really difficult time. But during the first uh, time, 
the teacher training college put in place trying to do uh, teaching and learning using smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good idea because it kept us in contact with the students, uh, but only those who had uh, good broadband, which was in Juba, were able to really benefit by the program. So, I mean, it was probably the only program of its kind in the country. So we learned a lot, but we also had to admit that, uh, you know, it didn't work. And face-to-face yeah. -face teaching and learning is what you have to have. And I think that's true probably throughout most of Africa, except maybe South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but we've done uh, an extensive evaluation of the whole organization from board level all the way through wow. in 2018. And um, many of the recommendations of that are being currently being implemented about how we do things and how it's organized, et cetera. So lots to learn from. Yeah, and Bruce, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I would say um, David asked a question earlier about who was at the table when we created our recommendations for practice. And those were based on the WHO's um, twinning partnerships uh, recommendations. And so we really have created a, a, a profile in our recommendations where, or a, a process where you start with self-assessment and you go to needs assessment. And then you look at the, that gap analysis of what assets are actually available. And plan, then you go to planning and we've added a couple from that weren't there in the WHOs because we felt like there were a lot of volunteers. Um, so that selection and orientation was important, but into implementation. And we actually went as far as to say, we need to do monitoring and evaluations, but then we need to take those and learn to lessons learned so that when we go back into the process of assessing why we're here again at, at still at this time, that you're bringing those lessons learned back, back to what are we, what's our next project or how do we proceed from here? Thank you. Um, let me put this out to the community, all right? If you personally weren't there, all right, what would stay in the community and what depends on you and your organization continuing to be present? Um, we have a, an expression here at CREA, we want to be, what we call it, wanted but not needed. In other words, we're trying to pass on all the knowledge, all the skills and so on to the communities that we work with. Um, it's not an easy thing to even think about. So how much are the communities that you're working with dependent upon you and your organization? And then what can be done to move them towards self-dependence. I don't like the word independence because none of the work we do is independent. I think you understand what I'm saying. Mr. Ruth, I could answer that by telling you that our organization is all Ecuadorian. So I'm okay with the Ecuadorian community becoming dependent on an all Ecuadorian organization. Um, but I, uh, to, but to better answer that question, and it actually works in another question that someone put on the chat was, how do you prioritize? Well, what, mm -hmm. do you, what are your priorities as an organization? And, and of course, we, we would, I think NGOs in general, and I know this is probably more of a development philosophy than anything else, but NGOs tend to work in places where either the public sector hasn't reached or where the private for-profit sector feels as though there's no profit to be made. And so those are the populations that are left um, vulnerable. And so if you're an organization, if your NGO is working with those communities and suddenly the public sector steps in, I think there is an obligation for you to think twice about what it is that you're doing. Um, we, we do this all the time in our organization. Uh, we, we think a lot about uh, what kind of services we should be offering. And if you're a typical NGO, uh, from say the United States, uh, most people from the United States feels that preventive medicine is the key to everything and NGOs should be working on prenatal exams, well child exams, vaccines, uh, health education. Well, the fact of the matter is in a place like Ecuador, those are the four things that the Ministry of Health does fairly well. So why would we do something that they're already doing? 
because then all we're perceived as is a threat to the Ministry of Health. So instead of being a partner with them, we're competing with them. So what we try to do is find services that the Ministry of Health can't, for, can't, can't provide. So we provide a lot of curative services and people would think, well, why are you in the curative service business? That's, it's all about prevention. But I think that's kind of a myopic view of it if you don't understand local realities. And so the government of Ecuador wants us to provide curative services to their, to their patients because that's the piece that, is, that gets ignored pretty significantly. So just one, one example of that. Okay, anybody else? Well, I can just say that the whole goal of solidarity with South Sudan was to build capacity and then turn it over uh, to the bishops uh, or to the church, I should say the local church, depending on who they appoint or ask to run it. But one of the pieces has been making sure that we send uh, students, graduates with uh, competence on for further study so that they can come back as tutors or as uh, administrators of the institutions. Um, I would say that's a long-term uh, thing and eventually we'll probably have to support uh, the institutions with uh, funding uh, until such time as the country, which I say is rich in natural resources, can support this. But in, when we went into South Sudan, they never even had a Department of Health until 2005. So they don't have any of the, the resources or the competencies uh, that are required. And um, even with the midwifery training of midwives, um, they built uh, different groups have built uh, institutions where they want to train midwives, whether it's government or others, but they don't have the professionals to teach. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, there's so, it's going to be a while before what we do is uh, sustainable locally mm -hmm. in terms of prof professionals and also in terms of. Uh, uh, the ability of the church to assume responsibility. They don't even have a help desk at the church, if you can imagine. One doctor has just been appointed as health coordinator. Now, okay. if you look at East Africa, you look at Kenya, Uganda, they're well-developed um, medical services and medical bureaus. So um, there's a long ways to go in South Sudan. It's probably the most undeveloped structurally. Okay. Yeah. Country on the globe. I would say we're not going to run out of work to do, at least not in my lifetime. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not in mine either. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're probably the youngest amongst us. So I don't know um, whether you'll ever run out of work to do. All right. Um, there's a, a question, a number of questions that kind of touch on each other. How do you evaluate the things that have not worked, get the learnings from them? but then be able to let them go, or hopefully be able to let them go. That's a rough one. Anybody? Or should I ask another question? No, I think it's important. I think uh, things that don't work are just as important as all the scientific publications that have negative results. Uh, there should be a journal of negative scientific uh, studies uh, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to learn from those negative studies, and there's a lot to learn from doing things um, from, from failing in certain in the certain endeavors that you that you take on. Uh, the problem is that. Um, not only is it important for the for the NGO in partnership with the community to learn how to give up on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a failed idea, how to let it go. The problem is, and this gets back to the publication, is that how do you share that with the wider community, the global health community? There aren't really any journals out there. I'll tell you right now, The Lancet and uh, the New England Journal of Medicine and the British Medical Journal, they don't want to read about these, about these kind of failures. So the question yeah. is, where, where do you get to put these things to share with the greater community? Mm -hmm. um, so that's 
I didn't really answer the question completely, but I wanted to just be able to, to say that. I think Bruce and Sister Ruth are going to have much better, or Sister Joan are going to have much better answers. I was thinking of, um, of the COVID response. I mean, we're using the Western model um, in a place, a place like, like South in a place like South Sudan, which has probably a thousand cases and a hundred deaths. And uh, it is currently getting some access to virus, uh, to um, vaccination. But uh, I think people in South Sudan have learned how to deal with infectious diseases because they've dealt with HIV AIDS, they've dealt with Ebola, they've dealt with all of these, malaria, TB, all these things. They have uh, local ways of dealing with some of those things. And um, they will just say, oh yeah, it's another infection. <laughs> you know, in other words, it isn't always taken seriously, but I think we need to evaluate what are the best ways of, of uh, dealing with a, a pandemic in a country like uh, South Sudan as compared with the Western models. And I would, I would say, you know, CHA is not directly on the ground, it's our members. So, but we try to help people learn from each other's mistakes by um, providing these resources like I showed during my presentation um, and to amplify those so that we can build a consciousness amongst those that want to do this in the future of what those mistakes are. And we try and provide resources so that they can um, and tools that they can use to help uh, avoid some of those mistakes, asking those right questions, knowing the right people and places. Uh, but I think it's a really difficult question because it does get into politics as well and, and the way things are funded. And, um, and I think we have to be much more bold about going about the, the bigger mistakes that are how organizations get funded even with our own government here in the US um, because there's um, just too often, it's about, our, it's about the interest of our interest and uh, as a nation and not about the people that we're really trying to, yeah. saying we're trying to assist. Uh, and I, I think it's moving, and I think the last thing I'd say is it's, it's moving from pity for the poor to compassionate action on behalf of social justice uh, for the poor. That really is what I think will help us learn from those mistakes and move to a new, a new day. Maybe we should just mention, Bruce, that you have an excellent handbook for those in short-term ministry. You didn't mention that in your presentation, but it's excellent. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we have a reflection guide that ever is again available. We try to make these available to all. Um, that is unusual for a member association, uh, but I have said, you know, this is such an important topic that we need to, to raise, raise the uh, tide for all boats, not just those that are from Catholic health facilities. Um, that, that reflection guide for short-term global health activities is available. I'd like to ask one ending question. Um, and I don't know if it applies to you, David, as much as it does to Bruce and Sister Joan, um, but feel free to ask. When you come back to the US after you've been in Sudan or wherever, all right, in Haiti or, and people say to you, oh, how was your trip? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with it? I'm sorry, it's because well, it's, see, David, I think everybody understands what I'm saying. It, it's- I'll, I'll start because 20, 26 years ago when I went on my first trip, I blurted out all kinds of things. And much mm -hmm. like David earlier, I thought I could write a book after I was in Haiti for a week. I then moved, I went, I led 13 trips. I thought I less, knew less. I lived there for two years. I knew how little I knew as I was walking away. And so I come home from every trip wondering how I can know less each time I, I go. And 
I, I'm still amazed when I see people come back and you think they have a PhD in that country's history and they were there for 10 days. <laughs> to follow up on that, I, I have not done short, much short-term ministry. I once went to Haiti, uh, more on a political uh, venture, but anyway. Um, I think what's really important is that preparation for short-term ministry and for excellent follow-up where you're really debriefing in the light of uh, the, the pastoral circle, you know, see Judge Act and also Catholic social teaching so that the experience gets integrated and that you, you do that as a serious uh, venture um, because otherwise, uh, People don't see the underlying reasons for why things, the social analysis, the underlying reason for why, why things are as they are. And oftentimes also the role of the US uh, in US policy, uh, creating some of the condition that we see. Mr. Roof, mm -hmm. I think that the people that ask that question are the ones that are only gonna give you about 30 seconds anyways to answer. So. I don't get too stressed out about the people that ask how the trip was, but you just hope and pray that there are enough other people who will sit you down for an hour and, and pick your brain. And, right. uh, mm -hmm. and, and that, that's where there's a little more, um, I guess, satisfaction in talking about things. But how was your trip is usually followed up with, did you see the Cubs game uh, yesterday? So, um, so, I don't, I don't get too worried about that. I, I remember initially that getting under my skin a little bit, but uh, I, it's, it, there's no point in being angry with people like that. It's just things that people aren't not, they're not trained to really ask those questions in any, in a better yeah. way. No, it's not a question of being angry. It's a question of just how do you deal with it? There's a sister not far from Korea um, who just came back from 32 years in Ecuador and um, one of our local retired bishops who spent lots of time in Latin America said, please, could you spend some time? So we talked on the phone and I finally said to her, the hardest thing is coming back, not being down there. All right. And she said to me, somebody who understands and you can just hear her relax. And I see, John, you, are, you understand what I'm saying. So there's a certain, yes, you can blow people off or not pay attention to them, but you also, we also need a the people to understand what we're experiencing mm -hmm. and so on. Um, the co-founder of CREA, and then I'll bring this to a close, but the co-founder of CREA, Sister Catherine, who was Sister of Mercy, who died almost, almost three years ago now, um, spent years in Tanzania. And that's what had us click was the fact that we didn't look at everything. When we founded CREA 20, almost 25 years ago, we didn't look at everything just from the U.S. perspective. We looked at it not only from the countries we had been in, but we had learned to look at it in a much more integrated way and so on. Um, it makes you feel a little less crazy when there's somebody who understands what you're talking about. So but thank you very much for your presentations, for all the preparation that you did, the time that you spent with us. Um, and I'm sure that there are going to be people that will want to follow up with you. Um, we have all the contact information and so on. So thank you very much and stay, stay well, stay well, stay well. All right. And uh, to be continued. Go in thank peace. You. Thank you.